You have about 90 days until summertime. In today's episode, we're going to lay out the blueprint, how to do this right, how to get in shape, how to get ready for summer over the next 90 days. I actually really, where did this episode idea come from? Right. I was talking to our um, our team that answers questions on our website that does a live chat. Yeah, yeah. And um, they were suggesting. Is it Margaret or Rob? I believe Margaret or? was the one that suggested okay. this. Yeah, she said, hey, this would be kind of a good episode. We've done episodes like this before. You know, I don't like the short, like 30 day ones or whatever. 90 days is still more kind of reasonable. short, but yeah. yeah, but this is more reasonable. And I oh, think you, you can, can do make, it right. You can make significant change in 90 days. Now, yeah. granted, if sustainable you, though, if right? you, uh, yeah, I mean, it all, it all, it depends, it depends on where we're coming from, right? Yeah. Like if you're uh, coming from a hundred pounds overweight, uh, misleading someone to believe that yeah. they can get ripped, but you could you can make significant change in 90 days, still even that person, um, but I never, uh, I never even took ninety days to get ready for a show. So you, yeah. if, if you maintain yourself in, in in relatively good shape, right, you can get in really good shape in, in a ninety day. Yeah, period I think of time. the caveat so, is like starting this, you should you should not have poor health. Yeah. Uh, so you know you're cleared by your doctor. You you've got decent mobility, no major medical issues. Then I think we can do this. But what I what, what I like most about the way you structured this is. You know, and I've explained this to my family and friends, like when they get started on their their journey and, you know, and, and I always see them like, okay, they went from, you know, last week, you know, eating all over the place, not working out, not doing anything. And then they like something happened, right? Or they got a goal or something, something happened where there's uh, they do a the challenge. But the kitchen or, it, so in my family right now, this is really funny right now. So for Christmas, uh, my sister-in-law got uh a family photo for everyone. So the whole family has, they haven't done, it got the, like everybody together mm -hmm. to do like a professional photo shoot. And so the family knows that in, this is actually like in about 60 days, uh, cause we've known about it for a while, right? 60 days is the, the photo shoot. Oh. And so the whole family is like, <laughs> nobody's drinking, everyone's doing uh. like, but it's so funny because the, we, we go, and this is, I think people make this mistake a lot where they go, uh, you know, on, they're on one side, they're not tracking, they don't care anything. And then all of a sudden it's like, ah, like full on. It's like, you know, it's really crazy because I I've, I never did it that way. It was always like, okay, my goal is to get shredded, but I'm like, I make incremental changes like weeks over week or month over month of things. Because just by like the first, you know, the first month that you have set up here, I was looking at the notes and I'm like, yeah, you just do these things and you're already going to see traction over the week over week. Well, there's two thing, two points to make with this. One is in terms of sustainability, behavior change is less likely to stick when it's you know, massive change all at once that mm -hmm. rarely ever works. Yep. And I think people understand it. I don't think I need to make the case. If I tell people you're going to make huge changes in a very short period of time, what are the odds that you're going to maintain those changes? People, I think the average person would say, well, there's also this, are, are, you know, low. There's also this, that like the, uh, the us building muscle, us burning body fat, us school, right? This is yeah. all a part of the adaptation process from right. the thing we're seeing. And, it, your body will only allow you to adapt so fast. That's the right. other part is it's not just the psychological mm. aspect of sustainability. It's also physiologically, mm. your body will respond faster and better if you take this approach as well. So it's not like you're trading slower results right. for mm. the sustainable You'd be more approach. more efficient because you have to allocate all those resources in that direction as opposed to a bunch of directions. Well, well here, here's what happens. If you shock your body with too much all at once, first off, it's a stress on the body. Exercise alone. Let's just stick with that, right? When you work out, the reason why your body gets stronger and more fit is because it it, it detects this new stress and then it, it it aims to adapt to the stress so that it no longer is a stress, right? So if you did five push-ups today, that was real hard for your body to get stronger. Five push-ups is no longer hard for you. Well, that's why then you go and try to do six or seven to continue that progress. So it's a stress on the body. If you throw too much stress at the body at once, the body goes into, for lack of a better term, a kind of a survival mode where it's like, well, we're going to store body fat. We want to kind of prime ourselves to store body fat. We're going to ramp up your appetite. We're going to decrease muscle mass because muscle mass costs a lot of nutrients in relation to other parts of the body or other organs of the body. So you'll actually make your body more resistant to change if you go all everything all at once. So this approach isn't just the psychologically sustainable approach this is also the best way to get results period and physiologically too yes. yeah uh, this is so th the birth of me saying uh you know my goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change 
didn't come till later in my career till this came full circle, yeah. this understanding. Because like many cl many clients of ours and myself, I made that mistake early on too, thinking like, oh, I'll just throw everything at it right now because I want to get there as soon as I possibly can. And it's, you know, after years and years of experience, realized, and then also really understanding the, the adaptation process, the physiology that's going on here, also the behavioral side mm -hmm. and everything. Once that all kind of came full circle, then it was like, oh, like this is, this is kind of silly to do all this at once. I'm going to get the same amount of results or more potentially doing less. So why would I throw all that up? By, by balancing this delicate balance of, you know, calorie restriction with the new stimulus. It's like, man, I only got to do a little bit of this stuff and, and slowly alter things over the course. And I will see the most amount of results versus starting with the stuff that I'm going to be at in three months right now, right out the gates and working extra hard when it's even more difficult to do it because you haven't been doing anything yeah. and seeing less results. Yeah. Remember, like I said earlier, um, one of your body's safeguards against excess stress is to reduce your caloric requirements and nutrient requirements. And that's paring mm -hmm. muscle down is one of the best ways it does that. Save energy. So you actually, you know, some people are like, well, I lose more weight when I do everything all at once. Well, yeah, you lose more muscle is what ends up happening. And you really set yourself for failure by slowing your metabolism down. And if you want to be a smaller, you know, same flabbiness version of yourself with a slower metabolism, then do that. But if you're looking to do this in a way to where you sculpted, you're firm, it's body fat that you lose, you get a faster metabolism at the end of this. So it's more sustainable. You, you can actually eat more while maintaining a leaner, lighter body weight. Um, well, then this is, this is the approach. Today's giveaway is MAPS Aesthetic. To enter to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, this episode is brought to you by our partners at mphormones.com. They provide testosterone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy. They also work with every peptide you've ever heard of, including the GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide, terzepatide, or brand names Ozempic. They have the peptides, but this is with doctors and real regulated pharmacies. So go to mphormones.com, fill out one of their forms, talk to a doctor, talk to one of the people there and see if it's all right for you. Also, these are the final hours for our sale uh, program sale this month. MAPS Anabolic, half off. MAPS Anabolic Advanced, also half off. If you're interested and you got here in time, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Now, the, the first part, and I'm, I'm going to make the argument that this first part I'm going to say right here, of all the stuff that we're going to talk about is the most important because this first part is what's going to drive everything else. And this first part, this first piece is the most important aspect of sustainability. This is the biggest factor that determines whether or not what you're doing is sustainable or not. And that is to fix your why, right? So we're going to talk about the how here in a second, all the steps you could take. But first we need to talk about the why. Now, if the why you're trying to make these changes is because you don't like the way you look, you think you're fat, you're not good, inadequate, whatever, then this is going to be very difficult to sustain because you can motivate yourself to make big changes through shame and self-hate, but you really rob yourself of the joy that could be there from feeling like this is a voluntary growth pursuit. There's, it's very different when you do this because you're like, well, I'm overweight, uh, but I want to take care of myself. I, I, I think I deserve to be fit and healthy, or I want to eat in a way that nourishes myself when now it feels very different. Uh, the other way at some point starts to feel overbearing and tyrannical and almost always leads into rebellion. This is where you go off your diet in such a big way or you just stop working out because you want to quote unquote enjoy your life. So you have to start with the why. And this is a conscious decision because it happens unconsciously. And what I mean by that is you have to constantly remind yourself, I'm going to the gym because I want to take care of myself. I am going to eat this way, not because I hate myself, not because I'm gross or fat or whatever. I'm going to eat this way because I deserve to be healthy. I deserve to be cared for like somebody I care for. Uh, if you do it in this fashion, then it feels good. Exercise is self-care. It's not punishment. And diet is nourishment. It is not restrictive. The other reason why this part is so important, the most important piece of all this is this is like your home base. And the inevitable is going to happen during this process of you drifting away from that. Of course. And, and, and always, I mean, this is also like very similar why understanding your why in business is so important. Like as the business grows and scales, it gets more complex and you get distracted and all these other things. And before you know it, you've completely taken a left from what originally made you start this thing. And that's always the the demise of, of businesses. The same thing goes for your journey with this is like, 
you start off with the right intentions and then you get you get hooked on the scale or you get hooked mm -hmm. on like a look and then mm -hmm. before then you're taking these things you shouldn't be taking and then you're getting up in your training when you're, you didn't get good rep and then all of a sudden you're starting to do these behaviors that don't align with your why and so this is so important one of my favorite things to do with clients um, when they would tell me like a like a, a superficial goal of I want to look a certain way um, I'd always nod oh yeah yeah definitely we'll get there and stuff like that and then I'd circle back through like questioning is I really try to peer into like the things that they really really truly cared about like is it is it being a good mother or a father um, is it being great as an, an, an employee or an employer like a, a great leader in your family um, is it, you know, what is it, uh, is it a good, being a great spouse? Like what, what drives that person, um, and the things that really matter to them in life outside of what they look like. And then, or what do they think that looking different is going to bring them? Right. Let's right. Talk about that. So really try and attach to that, that way, as I, as I set these goals or, or, or lead them through this process, I'm always reminding them that the, you know, the better version of them leads to the, the, the better, yeah. you know, dad and or inevitably you're going to hit, uh, challenges. And when you hit roadblocks, if the reason why you're doing this is to take care of yourself, then those roadblocks are not really roadblocks. Yeah. You'll get through them a lot. Yeah. Easier. Oh, I didn't lose weight this week, but you know what? I'm taking care of myself. I still right. feel good. You know, this is good. I still, I, I still want to take care of myself. Not that big of a deal. If it's like I'm fat and gross and ugly, and I haven't lost weight in two weeks. Well, screw it. I'm not doing this anymore. Like, I don't want to do that. I, I hate I hate myself. This isn't working. Forget it. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Or what typically happens is the process becomes so painful and so crappy because every workout's a punishment. And every time you eat, <clears throat> it's just restrictive. It's not mm -hmm. what you what you want to eat. You know, imagine this. Imagine if you want to eat healthy. That's what fixing your why does. Is it makes you want to eat in a way that's healthy versus I have to eat this way. Uh, but I actually want to eat this this other way over here, but I have to do it this way. That's not going to last. Now, the second part to this first month, so this is month one that we're talking about, right? Fix your why. Then the second thing you want to do in that first month is start lifting. Now, you're going to be lifting the entire time, but if you're not lifting weights, strength training needs to be the foundation of your workouts. Now, it's really important you don't view your strength training as a calorie-burning workout, okay? Here's why that's important. If you look at your strength training workout as a calorie-burning workout, inevitably – you'll turn it into circuit training or something else that does not give you great results. Strength training is the stimulus that gets your body to build muscle through that process. Hormones balance out, speed up the metabolism, far more effective. If you just think of calorie burn, your body adapts very quickly to that and the results plateau, stop, and sometimes you end up losing muscle. So start lifting, but the intention with that is not to burn a ton of calories. The intention is to get stronger. I would also add to this point in this first month, commit to what's realistic to you at lifting. So don't all of a sudden start lifting five days or seven days a week when you came from doing no lifting whatsoever. Be reasonable with yourself. If you can see yourself going to the gym two to three times a week for the rest of your life, well, then maybe you can commit to something like that. Right. If you're really uncertain about this and this is really new territory for you and you you already have kind of a negative, maybe only start with one time a week. During this first month, we're trying to figure all that out and then allow yourself to naturally become addicted to the feelings that you get from working out that makes you want to come a second day or a third day of the week. But keep that in mind when you first start off with this, that more does not mean more results necessarily at this point. Pay attention to what is a realistic schedule or a realistic amount of days you get, you can train that you could do forever. And we want to focus on building our body up. So that way too, if you're thinking about, I know 90 days is like kind of a set goal, but building something that's sustainable, this is the approach that we have to take. We have to take it from the start of like building our body up to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the strength and we have um, everything accounted for. So when we add more stress and we add these situations where we're not, we're in a deficit and, you know, our body's reacting to that, we don't have as an adverse reaction. Yeah. And in, in strength training, and the data shows this very clearly. As far as methods of exercise at burning just pure body fat, nothing comes close to strength training. And of course, I don't need to make the argument when it comes to building muscle. Someone may be listening and say, I just want to build muscle. Obviously, strength training. So it's the most effective form of exercise for both of those goals. Um, so regardless of whatever goal you have, start lifting. And if you're already lifting, you're 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 good. But if you if you're not, I mean, I'll tell you what. 
my beginner clients, I would start one or two days a week um, with strength training. My advanced clients, I train three days a week. Mm -hmm. I didn't train advanced clients more than three days a week. There's a lot you could do within one or two days a week before you have to it's add really an necessary. extra day. Especially right. in the first month. That's right. In the first month, it's so unnecessary to add any more volume. It won't Other, get you more results. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're especially what you have to understand. What Where do you happens. go from there? Yeah, you don't have a lot to go from. You all Typically, what people do when they start this too, they start to change some of their eating habits so their calories end up naturally getting reduced. And then you're also doing all this volume of training. There's no reason to be doing beyond three when we're starting this off. All right, next thing to do in that first month is to prioritize sleep. So, all right, what does that look like? Well, about an hour before you go to bed, prepare your body for sleep, turn the lights off or down, be more relaxed, don't have any food a couple hours before you go to bed. Go to bed at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every day. That includes weekends. A lot of people on Friday nights and Saturday night go to bed late, try to sleep in. Come Monday morning, they're, they're jet lagged. Now, the data on sleep, because you might be thinking, well, who, what does sleep have to do with all this? The data on this is remarkable to the point where there's, there's some studies actually show that when people lose weight with poor sleep, 50% more of the weight comes from muscle mm -hmm. than from people that get good sleep. Poor sleep also radically changes your cravings and your appetite, your energy, your mood. Hormones. This is a big one. Like, like in fact, people typically get leaner if they go from poor sleep to good sleep, just simply by fixing sleep alone. So prioritize this in month one and then maintain this throughout the whole uh, process. I, I love simple things that you can remember. I, mean, I know we had Cabral on here and he talked about the three, two, one method. That's the one. I was um, thinking, yeah. So that's kind of typically what I would recommend to somebody because there, uh, there's a lot of facets that go into improving your sleep. It could be this, it could be that, could be something hormonally. There could be a lot of things going, but generally speaking, if you really attack that three, two, one rule, uh, most all people, even if they have some other underlining issue, will see improvement in their sleep simply by doing that. Now, what is this? Three hours before Three hours bed. before, no food. That's right. So the, your your last meal should be three hours before you go to bed. Your last drink of any fluid or uh, water, two hours before. The last bit of any sort of electronics, television, anything like that, one hour before. Awesome. That's so the, the, just sticking to that or making that a good goal tends to send most people, regardless of what's disrupting their sleep, at least improving mm -hmm. you know, a, a good percentage from that. This alone. next one, uh, in again, in studies across the board, um, has been shown to reduce someone's caloric intake on pretty consistently by about 10 to 15%. And that is to simply eat without distractions. So you don't have to change what you eat. Just don't eat in, with your phone next to you or while you're watching TV or on your computer. Eat the same food. Just don't eat with any distractions and your caloric intake will start to regulate itself much more naturally to your caloric demands. Very simple, but consistently effective uh, thing that you could do. And then next up with that is to avoid processed foods. This is a bigger impact, right? Heavily processed foods, foods that come in wrappers and boxes, studies will show will result in five to 600 more calories a day in consumption, even when macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs are controlled for. Just those two things right there tend to result in some nice fat loss without even tracking a single I, calorie. I, I want to add something to this part that seems a bit counterintuitive, especially when somebody is on like a major weight loss goal. I actually am telling myself, I'm telling my clients this at this at this stage of our, our journey, I want you to eat every time you're hungry. Do not not eat. If you mm -hmm. just ate and then half don't hour later- Don't try to restrict. Yeah, don't try and restrict right now. If you are avoiding eating in front of your computer or your phone or TV and you're not eating processed foods, eat. If you're hungry, eat. I want my client at this stage to always feed themselves because you'll see it and we get to the later stages, we will start to get into tracking and paying more attention. But what always happens naturally when you take somebody who was eating processed foods, eating distracted, and you just get that out of the way, they're going to eat less food. And I, at this point, I'm concerned with making sure that we have this new stimulus to build muscle, to speed their metabolism up or strength training. I want them fed. I want to make sure they're getting enough nutrients. So I'm encouraging them to, to eat, Great just point. choose whole foods. Yeah. All of this is just pointing back to awareness and it's like bringing all those data points in. So you see, uh, you have to, to acknowledge, you know, putting food in your mouth, what kind of food it is like, and all of that, just, we're just so distracted to the phones or we're driving or whatever it is, uh, you know, justification, but just to focus on that part makes a huge difference. Right. All right. Next up is to hit water targets. Um, so a lot of people don't attract their water whatsoever, but typically I'll have somebody aim for around a gallon of water or maybe a bit less a day. 
And this almost always results in some favorable results in terms of appetite, energy, and even caloric intake. It sounds silly, but try it yourself. Track it throughout the day. Typically aiming for around a gallon a day for most people, mm -hmm. in my experience, so consistently, people would get some fat loss and would feel a lot better just from doing that. Yeah, no, this is ex this is especially true with somebody who drinks so simple. a lot of like uh, canned stuff, you know, sodas and uh, definitely any sort of calorie drinks that they're having and they're just not getting enough, enough water doing. And I don't, you know, it's been, this has been interesting in my own personal journey uh, I've noticed before too, uh, how much hydration plays a role in just my energy levels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes I catch myself being guilty of this of going like, Oh, wow, I started the morning and my, my, my water I had was coffee mm -hmm. with caffeine in it. Right. And then I had another energy drink and, and then here it is. And then I had like a Sevia or something like that, but I haven't even had just a, a glass, you know, or two of just straight water. And I wonder why I feel like that and getting water just in me and getting hydrated. I make a huge difference just in my energy level. So Aside from it also keeping them from probably drinking things they shouldn't Yeah, drink. that and like uh, headaches or even kind of like uh, joint pain and things like that. Yeah. I've noticed like it's just, it's so funny when you are just paying attention to making sure and being intentional about drinking water. A lot of these like things and lulls in the middle of the day, energy wise, like you said, like there's just, if you're hydrated, you avoid a lot of those things. Yeah. Now, lastly, in for month one. Don't weigh yourself. Do not weigh yourself. You're going to be tempted to, but don't, because that will 100% get in your head. And almost everybody who weighs themselves starts to try to overcorrect or change things in that first 30 days. And we will weigh you, just don't want you to get on the scale at all for that first 30-day period. I like to get people, you know, kind of give them a nice surprise by month two, because by the time they get to month two, they weigh themselves, they see, oh, because what's going to happen in that first month is you're going to get leaner. In fact, you might not even lose a single pound, although a lot of you will. A lot of you are just going to have a nice little transfer of fat loss with muscle gain, but I don't like people weighing themselves in that first 30 day period at all. Yeah. I mean, I, if we weigh at all during this process, it's normally for me as the coach and trainer, just to get some feedback. I really, I try and avoid that as much as possible because it, it tends to only get people uh, discouraged or in their head about what they think should be happening on the scale, which many times does not align with what is ideal with what you want as a coach. And so Try to avoid this. At a, and notice, too, this is the first month, right? Like, yeah. there's not any of these massive shifts or changes or things we're saying, you can't have this, you can't have that, you can't do that. It's like, these are just some real foundational things that if they start to pay attention to this, they start focusing on these things, you're going to start to see your, your, your body changing and moving in, in the right direction before we even get to month yeah. two. Month two is now where we're going to start to track a little bit, and now we're going to start to kind of pay attention a little closer. So now you're 30 days in. All right, we're on month number two. Now I want you to aim for your protein targets. I want you to hit your goal body weight in grams of protein, and I want it from whole natural foods. So if you want to weigh 130 pounds, if you want to weigh 180 pounds, you want to weigh whatever, hit that in grams of protein. Now the data on this, again, very clear. It is an incredible appetite suppressant. It actually maintains appetite very, very well. So people tend to almost always reduce their calories just by hitting protein. It also results in more fat loss and definitely more muscle gain by simply doing this. By the way, this is a bit harder than it sounds. The reason why I didn't put it in month one is because you got to start with those other steps before you try to hit protein targets consistently. The average person hearing this might be like, oh yeah, you know, I could do that. No problem. No, no. Once you start to track, I mean like the average woman even trying to hit 120 grams of protein uh, a day. That's that's a decent amount of protein to hit. Uh, you know, over three meals or whatever. So. I mean, I'm I'm going to sum this month two up completely with this. I know we have a couple other points that you have, but and this month, like that is the goal because almost everybody at this point we haven't tracked, we haven't paid attention. We start paying attention. Almost everybody is under consuming pro mm -hmm. protein at this. There's a very very small percentage of people that I ever coach that are hitting train. this on average. Yeah, that are just like naturally hitting their protein intake every single day, almost, and I don't care, male, female, what size you were, it doesn't matter. Almost everybody is under consuming that, and it's their, most of their diet was loaded up full of processed foods and carbohydrates and saturated fat, and when, I, when the first month when I moved them away from that, it dramatically drops everything, and I now have to reintroduce making sure we go after protein. And so it becomes the major focus in month two is continue doing everything we've been doing the prior month. And we are now just tracking and most most importantly, tracking protein all month long. Yes. Now, next up would be to track all your food. So get yourself an app like 
fat secret. And now what you're going to do, you're trying to hit your protein targets. Don't worry about hitting carb and fat targets, but do track your food. This is going to come in handy because you're going to get a, a nice general idea of what you're consuming on a regular basis. And this is what's going to be very important for the third month when we really start to pull on some levers. So all you're going to do basically is enter in the food that you eat, be accurate about it. And eventually we're going to use that, those numbers to decide what direction we're going to go uh, in month three. The next step is to also track your steps. This is a, a kind of a proxy for movement. How many steps you're taking today? Am I taking 1,000, 3,000, 10,000, whatever? Don't change anything, but track your steps so that we can have an average. Because again, this is going to give us another lever that we can pull uh, later on in month three when we start to make it uh, a little bit more specific. This is important to me because how I would train, and by the way, too, it took me a while to get here as a coach. Um, this became this became the way that I recommended uh, any even cardio, right? So I did it through steps. And the only reason why clients would eventually maybe get on a piece of a cardio equipment is because over time I had slowly moved their steps up and moved them up. And then until they finally get to a point where like, Adam, you know, we're up to like 17,000 steps a day now. Like it would really help if I could get on the treadmill for an hour and actually just knock those out because finding these 10 minute, 20 minute walks or where to get accumulate that many steps was difficult. And then we would move in that direction. But up until that point, this is the tool, the metric I want to use to encourage more calorie burn. I don't want to do it through my strength training. Program. Strength training is for building muscle, building metabolism. Yeah. Steps in moving, that's when we get into the trying to increase calorie burn a little bit through moving more. And right now at this phase of the journey, it's literally, let's just become aware of how much you normally move in a week so that I know in the coming months how to manipulate well, that. Well, it's so much more effective because you're accounting for their overall activity throughout the day, which yeah. then they can see like, uh, even with the the tracking the steps, like sometimes they can see like hours that uh, they actually burn more calories. It's very enlightening to, to know that you could be doing something you enjoy uh, and you know, you're going to be burning more calories, uh, and, and be more effective with that. And it's going to stick more long-term than you are to just be stuck on a, on a hamster wheel. Totally. And then next up would be now if you can start to track things like body fat, uh, percentage and, and body weight. And I like to do this towards the end of the, or middle of this second month. And now we're just going to track it because what we're going to be looking at is, am I losing through this process? Yeah, trends. Pure body fat. And yes. And Adam, you make this point and I think you make it really well. Don't allow to give yourself at least two measurements before you start to yes. adjust things. In other words, if you test your body fat and your body weight and you do it again, and it doesn't move. Don't change anything. Wait for another test to see if there's anything that you need to change. Right, right. And then again, and even when you do see it, uh, let's say you have two tests in a row, body fat wise, and you saw you went up a, uh, you know, point something percent body fat, then you went up point something percent body fat again. Uh, incremental change. The, the trend is really slow in that direction. This is not a dramatic trend to see you point something percent going in the direction you don't like. That doesn't mean you need a massive shift. And that's what happens is a lot of people, that's why I don't even like the body fat percentage and the weight that much from people because they tend to overcorrect. Although this is important for a coach to know this and I want these numbers for the client. I caution you if you're doing this by yourself to not overcorrect when you see your first test comes back and it's not as positive as you thought it would be because the worst thing you could do is to overcorrect and then really send yourself the opposite direction. All right. So now month three, this is where we start to really start pulling some levers. By the way, if you're doing this right and you're following the steps, you're getting results this entire time. So when I say pull levers, I don't mean you've got no results up until now. Now we can really start to get results. Your body has been progressing this entire time. It's just now that we're in the third month, now we're going to pull levers, levers a little harder because your body's starting to adapt to those smaller changes that you've already made. So now, the, now what you do, now that you've tracked, you know what your calories are at, you know where your steps are at, you know all those things. Now we can start to change things a little bit. So now you decide whether or not you want to cut calories or you want to add calories, depending on your goal. If you're trying to lose weight, well, then you cut calories. And typically you want to go around 500 calories below what you've been consuming. And if you want to gain, then you typically go 500 calories above what you've been consuming. And it's really that simple, right? It's really, that's it. One of the things too, that's on this, in this category is where we've now tracked steps for a week. We're going to add steps some, and depending on where I'm at calorie wise with a client, I might choose to do a little bit of both, right? So if I know, let's say I have a client who consistently takes 
5,000 steps a day and they only eat, say, 2,200 calories, I might shave 2,200 calories and increase steps by 2,000. So I get kind of about a 500 calorie deficit, right? right? right so right. it doesn't always have to come from just food. If you like, if you feel like you're very satisfied with food, you don't have like blow, you're, you feel like you're eating just the right amount of calories, this is where we can use steps movement to create that deficit for you without getting on a piece of cardio equipment and busting tail and sweating like crazy just by moving more frequently today and keeping that and you have we have this option and some clients we go all steps and we keep our calories the same or some clients we go half bumping our steps half reducing calories or some go all reducing calories if i have a client who did a really good job of building their metabolism and they're coming from a place of 3,500, 4,000 calories. Well, the calories are easy. They have a lot of room to play with reducing calories. So we just cut that 500 calories and they're still eating a good amount of, of, of food depending on where, how low your calories. And this is where you, it takes like the, you know, uh, individuals here, like being able to customize this a little bit, knowing that, oh, I'm already down to 2,000 calories. If I take 500 off of that, I'm down to my 1,500. Yeah. I never want to get lower than that. So I might choose to go more steps yeah. there. So Yeah, this or is or if you're just taking almost no steps, if you're tracking your steps, right. you're like, oh my God, I'm only taking 3,000 steps a day. Well, that's yeah, right. bump your steps up because mm -hmm. you need to move more anyway just for your health. Exactly. Um, by the way, when you're adding steps, uh, it, I don't typically think people need to double their steps unless no. your steps are super low. No. Yeah. Uh, you're going to go up good 10, 15%, maybe 20%. I typically use about two increments of 2000, 2000 yeah. steps in a day. First of all, if you're eating, doing less than 2000 steps a day, you need to be moving. Yeah, that means yeah, you are yeah. very, very sedentary if you're under 2000. So 2000 a day in addition, whenever I'm manipulating, when you go up, yeah, mm -hmm. tends to tends to like at the end of it. And this is like, it depends on the person. And obviously there's a huge, massive variance here, but when I'm cutting people, like that's kind of works so around 2,000 steps. It's always worked for me. It doesn't matter how how big or small they are. That extra 2,000 a week is enough to create a caloric deficit that will will, will keep going. I was on. gonna say it's not like every day you're increasing 2,000. No, no, no. You're right. It's for so, the month. Yeah, the month. Yeah. yeah. So it's, so you're you're doing that. So if you were at, I you figure know, that's what you're. If saying. you were at 5,000 steps on average a day, then you went up to 7,000. That's steps right. And on gonna, average, and you're gonna maintain that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And then next is to increase your training volume with your strength training. So what does that mean? You add a couple more sets uh, to your strength training, or you make the workout a little bit longer. And now, now the notice I said a little bit. Don't double your training volume. Here's where people screw up. They get into month three, they're seeing great results, and they're like, you know what? This is when I get to pull the levers. I'm going to double my efforts in the gym. You will quickly get your body to stop progressing if you do that. You have to give your body what it can handle appropriately to adapt, not yeah. what it can tolerate what and definitely can not what you can recover from too. That's yeah. right. So the easiest hack for this one is to follow a MAPS program since we build that. Since we figured it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Since we, we build that into the programs to where you naturally increase volume over the course of the phases. And so otherwise you're sitting down trying to do the math and figure out, is this appropriate or not yourself? But that's what part of the reason why we've broken up all of our programs in phases, and most all of them are three phases. There's a few that we have that are four phases long, but most are three phases. Yep. And so about ninety days. Yeah. So mm -hmm. following a maps program while doing this will take care of the the nice natural progression over the course of three months. Totally. Now there's here's some ways that you know you're doing everything right. You're getting stronger in the gym. I can lift more weight, or I could do more reps. I have great energy throughout the day. I don't have energy crashes. I don't feel down. I don't feel tired. Um, body fat percentage going down. That's a great one, right? Not weight. Notice I didn't just say weight on the scale going down, but rather body fat percentage going down. There's different, there's different ways you could test your body fat, a DEXA scan or a good old fashioned body fat caliper test will do this. Um, you're gaining muscle. You can get that by taking a body fat test and weighing yourself and then doing a little math. And then lastly, do you feel better at the end of your workouts versus how you felt before? Your workout. Here's a telltale sign that your workout's inappropriate. You go into your workout, you finish your workout, and you feel like dog shit at the end. <laughs> you feel like you died. You need to have more energy at the end than you did going into it. That typically means you trained with the appropriate volume and the appropriate. You gotta set yourself up for the next workout. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think it's important at, at this phase too is that you're 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 now in a month three. You've been doing this. If you've been following steps too, you're also learning to connect to all the like the, your, the stuff you're mentioning. It's like. Yes, I know the goal might have been to lose 30 pounds or to get shredded for summer. Like, that's all important. That's great. But if you want to maintain this for the rest of your life, part of that process, too, is learning how to connect to 
like who cares? Maybe the the scale kind of stayed the same in this month, or maybe the body fat percent didn't move that much. But man, like I'm so much more productive at work. Oh man, I'm eating more more whole foods than I've ever ate in my life. Like my attitude's better. I'm more like my strength is up. Like really learn to attach those. And it's it's funny. Like you can't just be aware of it. It's almost like you have to say that to yourself and you're, and you're learning to reattach because we're all guilty of this, of being attached to these superficial goals of and ignoring wanna, everything else. Yeah. And ignoring that. And you, you know, a lot of people will hear this and go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I get it. I get it. But then like, you got to kind of learn to say it to yourself to where you start to reprogram the way you approach fitness because We've been marketed to for so long that it's a look. You know what I'm saying? It's a it's yep. a it's a look in the gym or it's a look that we're trying to obtain. And so it's really tough to think that you're just gonna hear us on a podcast or us tell you, oh, just try and attach to these things. And you go, Oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. And the, okay, well, do you really though? Because subconsciously you still are driven by yeah, I mean, this how many, look. How many times I had a client it's like, man, I didn't really lose that much weight, you know, over the last few weeks. I'm like, well, yeah, but how's your energy? I'm like, you know, now that you say that, I feel yeah. really good. You really know? strong. How's your yeah. sleep? Like, yeah, and you know, you went up 25 pounds on this lift. Yeah, you're right. You know what? We're doing great. But had I not pointed it out, they would have been so focused on the fact that scale right. didn't move in the direction uh, that they wanted. Look, we also have a free fat loss guide that you can get. It's totally free that can help you out. You can find it at mindpumpfree.com. Um, you can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano, and Adam is at mindpumpadam. 